We are moving into the next chapter. We're staying with the idea of uh, light energy and electromagnetic energy, but we're now focusing on the very narrow range of electromagnetic energy that your eyes can pick up. So we're looking at light and color. Uh, light is electromagnetic radiation, so everything you learned about electromagnetic radi radiation applies to light. But now we're just looking at that narrow wavelength of about 400 nanometers that you can see, excuse me, that you can see with your uh, God-given apparatus. So, um, light is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we studied last chapter, and it goes from wavelengths of 400 to 750 or so nanometers. Um, some people can see down as low as 380 and up as high as 780. So the people with really good color perception uh, are going to have a, about a 400 nanometer spread that they can see, that the, the, the colors that they can pick up. Um, the more average vision is, is about here, 400 to 700. Um, and those are the wavelengths of light. Nanometers, again, are incredibly small. So the wavelengths of light are very narrow, um, and it goes up and down really fast as it goes zipping through space. Okay. Um, we're going to be looking at some, some terminology here in this chapter as it talks about light and how light is made. Uh, light can be made a number of different ways, and so uh, one source of light is incandescent light. This is light that is produced by something that's heated until it glows. So old school light bulbs, which in some states are now illegal, where you have a filament that gets red hot because of electricity passing through it and shines, and that is what the old light bulbs always were. Um, those are incandescent lights, um, and that is heat-generated uh, light. You are also giving off incandescent light right now, but I can't see it, and neither can you, because you are hot enough to be glowing, but you're glowing in a wavelength of light that our eyes can't see. So I can't see the glow that Caleb, Caleb puts off. But he is glowing. And if I were to have a rattlesnake in the room, the rattlesnake would be able to see the wavelength of light that Caleb is glowing at and would be able to know where he is to go chase it down and bite his butt. Right? Um, and so incandescent light is light produced by materials that are heated until they glow. And uh, it needs to be pretty stinking hot for us to see the light. But uh, Lower temperatures produce uh, smaller, sorry, produce, yeah, longer wavelengths of light um, that just fall below our perception. Incandescent light bulbs, uh, are they still still legal in Hawaii? Do you still have incandescent light bulbs here? I can not light bulbs and light bulbs. Just what? Light bulbs are just light bulbs. Yeah, but can, can you still buy the bulbs that have, like, if you look in it, there's the two sticks in this, and the wire that goes across? Do you still? See those in stores? Yeah? Okay. I see a lot of the spiral. Yeah, which are the complex, compact fluorescents. Um, fluorescent light is produced by materials excited by other forms of electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation. So fluorescent light is when you have something that gets excited, usually by an electric current or an electric field, and it says, woo, I'm excited. And part of its excitation is releasing light. And different um, substances release different colors and wavelengths of light uh, depending on their electron configuration. And your book will go into more detail on that. So incandescent is light produced because something is hot. Fluorescent light is light produced because a material has been excited by some other form of energy. And the excitation that's created produces light, among other things. Usually incandescent lights are hot, and you lose a lot of energy to heat of the bulb. Fluorescent lights tend to be much more efficient because they, uh, they don't give off nearly as much thermal energy. You can grab a fluorescent light bulb that is on, and it'll be momentarily warm. You'll be like, oh, okay, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But if you grab an incandescent bulb that's on and cooking, you can burn yourself and be, be damaged. So. There's a lot less heat produced by these. They're a lot more efficient, which is why uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, um, certain cities and states started pushing people 
to buy fluorescent bulbs instead of incandescent ones. And now, of course, the big push is towards LED. Okay, so this is an old school fluorescent, uh, no, not fluorescent, an old school incandescent bulb where there's a filament here, um, a piece of string with some sort of material wrapped around it to keep it from actually combusting in a vacuum so that there's not enough oxygen for it to burn in truth. And it gets stupidly hot from electricity passing through it and it glows and that's an incandescent bulb. And so um, these are these are the old school bulbs. Uh, but it doesn't have to be a light bulb. This is an incandescent galaxy. And the reason you can see that galaxy at night is because it's hot and all of the heat is coming off as light. And you can see that's incandescent light coming off of that galaxy, right? Um, and of course, we are more familiar with lava here than many other parts of the world, although on our island, praise Jesus, nothing is currently erupting. Uh, but lava glows because it's hot. Hot things glow. And generally speaking, the hotter they glow, the more their wavelength approaches white. Uh, it looks to us like it's more yellowy white. Um, the red is not glowing as much because it's not as hot as the yellow color. And when it gets really, really hot, it looks white to us, although it's still not really white. It's just very bright yellow. Okay. Uh, but fluorescent bulbs, to entirely different. There's a gas in here, and there's an electrode on either side, and we pass an electric current through the gas. We create a strong electric field across the gas, and the gas gets excited by the electric field, and it glows. And that produces a lot less heat and a lot more energy efficient. So again, about 10 or 15 years ago, those were starting to be pushed. Um, and we can get fluorescent tubes or um, in lots of different colors. The color that's produced is based on the electron configuration of the element. You'll get this more in chemistry in two years. Um, but the, the color that's produced is based on the electron configuration of the probably a gas that's being excited to glow. So this is yellow and this is blue, and that's because this is a different element in here than this is in here. And the blue will always be blue because it's got a particular element that makes blue light. Um, and the yellow will always be yellow because it's got a particular element that makes yellow light. So different colors of fluorescent tubes are produced by different gases that are excited. Okay. Some things also fluoresce, not because of an electric field, but because they are excited by ultraviolet light and then they give off colors that we can see. So sea urchin shells, which is what these are, uh, sea urchin shells have chemicals in the composition of the shell that glows under black light. Um, and the reason is because the ultraviolet light comes in, we can't see the ultraviolet light, but it excites the, the molecules in the shell and they get all excited by the ultraviolet light and they give off wavelengths of light that our eyes can see. So Sea urchins glow under black light. So do scorpions. Scorpions glow under black light. Um, their shell has chemicals that give off light in the visible spectrum when they're excited by ultraviolet light that we can't see. Um, corals, the same way. Corals look awesome under black light. Um, and that's, that's the same thing. They're being excited by some kind of ultraviolet radiation and they give off visible light. So. We don't have as many scorpions here on the island as where um, I'm from in Arizona. Um, people in Arizona will sometimes go out at night with a mallet and a black light. And they'll walk around and shine the black light across their yard and look for scorpions that are out in the cool of the evening looking for meals. And they'll see this bright fluorescent bug run across their yard. And the scorpion can't see the ultraviolet light, so it doesn't know that it's been lit up. Uh, but it starts to glow. And so you can see it really easy. So it'll go out with the ultraviolet lights and whack them with mallets. And uh, in Phoenix and Tucson and those areas, there's tons of scorpions. And so it's a fairly regular thing to have to remove scorpions from your yard. Uh, so yeah, it's handy that they glow under black light. So kind of cool. What were you saying? Um, didn't we like see something like that at the UH portrait? I think so. Yeah, it was like in a tank. Yeah. Sound, sounds familiar. Other kinds of light, um, phosphorescent materials, 
they absorb electromagnetic energy and continue to emit light after the energy source is removed. So these are things that are quote unquote glow in the dark. Fluorescent things go dark as soon as they stop being excited. I have fluorescent bulbs up here above us, and when you turn off the electric field, the light goes out. But phosphorescent absorbs energy, and then while it's absorbing it, it's giving off a little bit. And then when the absorption is done, it continues to give off a little bit. And because it can store energy for uh, fairly long periods of time, it can glow well after it's done being excited. So I have on my watch, I have uh, glow-in-the-dark hands on my watch. So at 4 o'clock in the morning when I've got to get up and go to the bathroom, and I'm stumbling around in the dark, and I'm curious how much time do I have to sleep. When I get in bed, I can look at my watch and see, oh, good, it's 4.10. I can sleep for another hour and a half. And my the hands on my watch are readable, even in the total dark, because all through the day, they've absorbed a little bit of, of electromagnetic energy. And they, uh, they are glowing in the middle of the day, too, but you can't see it because it's very faint. But then when it's dark, that little bit of light that's given off, that little bit of glow, is, able, is, is uh, enough to help me read my watch, right? You guys probably have similar things um, in your house as well. Um, and there's glow-in-the-dark paint, and there's glow-in-the-dark tape, and there's all kinds of glow-in-the-dark things in our world. Um, so glow-in-the-dark is caused by phosphoric molecules that absorb thermal, uh, I'm sorry, absorb electromagnetic energy, and then release it later. And they release it very slowly. So you're not going to ever have a flashlight made of glow-in-the-dark material because it's just a little bit of light, but they release it very slowly and it lasts a long time. Uh, so we have phosphorescent paint, but there are also biological phosphorescent systems as well, where living things can release light because of phosphorescent chemical reactions, uh, and they can glow in the dark for a long time. So that's kind of cool. Um, some other terminology, this doesn't have to do with sources of light, this has to do with kind of light. So coherent light are sources that emit only one wavelength and all the waves are in one phase. And I'll show you pictures of that in a little bit. And these are lasers and it shouldn't say LEDs. That's an error. Um, LEDs are not in phase. LEDs are all one wavelength, but they're not in phase. Lasers are in one wavelength and in phase. So what in phase means is that when one, white, when one wave is peaking and then troughing, the, another light wave is peaking and troughing with it. That there's not one light wave peaking while another is troughing. All of the light waves are peaking and troughing together, so it magnifies the energy of the wave. They add up, which is why lasers can be deadly, right? Because all of that energy um, compounds and adds as it goes. LED light sources. Um, LED light sources are all one wavelength, but they they will not be in phase. They'll be peaking and troughing not together, which is why an LED is not used in surgery, but laser is. And then there's something called cold light, which are which is light produced by chemical reactions, not by heat. So a fluorescent light is cold light. Um, a phosphorescent light is cold light. It's not something that has heated up to the point where it's glowing. So an incandescent bulb is not, uh, but other sorts of light are. Uh, and so this is, uh, these are frequently going to be seen in nature. Uh, there's a lot of biological systems and chemical systems that produce light. And so those would be examples of cold light. Pictures. Uh, we have these exact same stickers in our school. Fire extinguisher with a downward arrow, you put it front of the fire extinguisher, there's not one in my room, but there are some of the others. And that fire extinguisher um, sign glows in the dark. So if you were to lose power uh, and everything else in the room is dark and there's a fire and the fire is why you lost power, it's also going to help you find the fire extinguisher in the dark, right? So glow in the dark stuff, phosphorescent light. Uh, there are exit signs that are glow in the dark for obvious reasons. If your light goes out, you want to know where the door is. Um, and then, of course, less uh, practical uses. There are toys that are glow in the dark because, gee, that's fun. 
don't we all want to glow in the dark? Hello Kitty. Um, the difference between normal sunlight and monochrome light like an LED and laser light is shown here. So sunlight has different wavelengths of light of different colors. They're not the same wavelength. They're not in phase. They're just randomly streaming through the atmosphere and you see color. An LED produces monochromatic light, light that's all one wavelength, but the wavelength is not in phase. So here we have three waves of light and they peak and trough at different times. Um, and so this would be a uniform color of light, but not very high energy because the peaks and the troughs add and subtract from each other. So the amount of energy is, is an average and it's a pretty low number. But a laser makes all one wavelength of light and makes sure that all of the waves are peaking and troughing and peaking and troughing together. So again, it all adds up. So this peak is not just you know, one peak, but in this picture with three wavelengths or three energy waves, it would be three times more intense because these three would all add up to each other, which is what makes lasers destructive because they have so much energy. Uh, it all adds up in the next one. Okay. And then um, here is just a way to make a laser. Um, if you have a if you have a lamp that's producing all kinds of colors of light, um, it's making just white light, right? It's not coherent and it's not um, it's not all of one color, etc. Then you can have a pinhole aperture that is gonna only let spatially coherent light through. Spatially coherent means waves that are peaking right there. So still, you're still gonna get multiple colors through because some of the waves are just lucky enough to peak right there and get through. Um, but you're gonna have waves that get through of all different colors, but all the ones of the color you want are in phase because they peaked right there. So they peak and they get through, and then you have another filter that filters out all of the colors of wavelength except for the one that you want. So this is a red laser. And so here you have coherent waves, but different colors. Now you have uh, all one color, and they were already coherent. So you can get, with two filters, you can turn a normal light into a laser, um, and you would get laser light coming out of the end which is one way of making a laser. It's not a very intense laser because you're making a lot of energy over here that you're not using. Uh, the ways that they make laser pointers now or laser tools now is not this way, but this was the first attempt at creating lasers. Okay? Today, they do something like this, where they will have a jewel um, that is going to only produce one wavelength of light when it is excited. And just like gases produce only one wavelength of light or a signature wavelength of light, um, crystals do as well. So they're going to get a, a crystal in there. In this particular one, it's a ruby. And they wrap the ruby in a flash coil that's going to excite it. It's going to give it light energy. It's going to say, woo, I'm excited. And that uh, flash coil is going to excite the, the crystal and make the crystal flash its signature color. Um, and then when you have the crystal of a particular size um, and you put some mirrors behind it, you're going to only be able to get one um, phased wavelength out of it because of the size of the crystal uh, and how the laser is built. So you, you excite a crystal and it's, it automatically produces one color of light and it's in phase. Um, and so this is, this is more the modern way of making a laser. And lasers are all different colors because of the different materials that they get to excite them. So um, helium neon lasers will be one color. Argon lasers will be another color. Ruby lasers will be another color. And they'll all be a color characteristic of the elements involved. Right. Uh, and so, and laser pointers come in all different kinds of intensity. Um, some laser pointers are pretty harmless, 
and you would have to really work hard to like burn a piece of paper with a laser pointer. You could eventually do it, but it would be kind of frustrating. Other lasers are really intense, um, and Mr. V has one that we will get to play with in a little while. I think tomorrow, maybe. No, I mean, not tomorrow. I think next week. Um, but we'll be playing with his, and it's strong enough to uh, light match heads and to pop balloons and things like that. It's pretty cool. Um, so different lasers obviously have different intensities. Um, some of them are strong enough to be used in surgery, and uh, some of them are strong enough to be used in war. So, yes. Well, the problem is, what do you? How do you get the energy to obliterate itself at a certain point beyond the emitter? That's the, that's the thing. Yes, you could get a laser that was that strong, but um, it would it would be infinitely long, and so you would destroy the house, the roof. You would destroy your shoes when you tried when you turned it on. Like you would, the 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 challenge is getting it to stop at a certain point. So that's the thing. The lasers. Yeah. You'd have to somehow focus it so that it canceled itself out. But that's the thing about a laser is they, they are all in phase, so they don't cancel each other out. So I don't know. Wait, this Theoretically, I'm sure there are people working on it. But I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You know those lasers in movies that like are crossing those red lines and then they always try to stop it? Are those real? Like in real life? Oh, uh, like like in heist movies with laser laser trip lines and yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah, those. Are so things. what happens if you trigger it? Will you get shot? Like no, that's just a, it's just a sensor. It would oh. know that something passed. Um, okay, objects will absorb certain wavelengths of light and reflect others. So this is why we see color. Your eyes see the reflected wavelengths and interpret them as an object's color. So red is not really red. Red is red because it's absorbing everything but red, and it's kicking red back out. It's reflecting the red, and then your eye sees the red and is like, oh, red. But in fact, you're seeing what the object did not absorb. So my, my awesome uh, yellow 50-50 bottle here is not actually this yellowy green color. It is absorbing everything else and kicking back yellows and greens so that my eye thinks that it's this color. But it is probably, in fact, every other color but these. It's, we're just looking at the reflection of what it does not absorb. Okay? Uh, so the wavelengths which reach your eye determine your perception of color. You only have a couple of color receptors in your eye. You know, how, many, how many do you guys have? Do you, know? do you know how many color receptors you have? Two. There's only three. You can see red, you can see green, and you can see yellow. Every other color that you see is your brain putting together the signal from yellow, red, and, and uh, yellow, red, blue, green. yellow, red, and green. Yellow, red, and green. Um, and so everything else, your brain has to assemble uh, signals from those three receptors and say, that's what this color looks like. So it's all an invention of your brain. Uh, the, the images are received in strength of yellow, strength of red, strength of green. And you can uh, interpret that data to make all different colors, which is incredible because you know, modern uh, televisions, you know, you can buy televisions that have billions of colors that they can make. But your eye seeing those billions of colors is interpreting those billions of colors with only three color receptors, and everything else is just an interpretation. So your brain is pretty amazing at being able to interpret colors. Uh, so again, the reason an apple is red is because light with lots of different lights hits it. Everything but red gets absorbed by the apple, and then the red is reflected back to you. So the apple is not absorbing red. And so you think the apple is red. Um, a red strawberry probably should look like this because this is all of the colors except red. Uh, and that's what the strawberry absorbs is all the colors except red. 
and it kicks back the red, which makes us think that it's that. It's kind of interesting. Um, oh, sorry, not yellow. It was red, green, and blue. Sorry, red, green, and blue. Um, so you have three receptors in your eye, and they only see these three colors, and every other color is just an interpretation of how much red, how much green, how much blue. And uh, your eye is able to create, or sorry, your brain is able to create an image with all the billions of colors that you can see with just three kinds of information. Praise the Lord for your brain. There are two color theories. We're almost done. Two color theories about how to make color. Uh, colors are mixed to produce other colors. The, the primary colors in, in a color wheel in an art class are red, yellow, and blue. And you can make many, 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 many colors by mixing together red, yellow, and blue paint. Uh, that would be the additive color theory. So the more kinds of wavelengths of color I mix together, the more uh, white it's going to get and the more colors I'm going to see. Um, so with light, if I have red light and yellow light and blue light and I shine those three lights at the same thing, that will be a pretty bright color and it'll look pretty much like white. Uh, and the, the more colors that I mix together, the more white it gets. Uh, televisions work on this theory. Anything that is a light image, my projector, works on this theory, where it adds colors together to get white. Uh, and you're adding wavelengths of light together. Uh, but paint is different. Paint absorbs colors. And so if I have red and yellow paint, and I mix them together and I say that's orange, it's not that it's producing red wavelengths and producing yellow wavelengths that then make me say, oh, it's producing orange wavelengths. It's that the red absorbs everything but red. So the red reflects red back to my eye. And the yellow absorbs everything but yellow. And so it reflects yellow back to my eye. And when I make the red paint and the yellow paint mix together, now the red is still absorbing everything but red and the yellow is still absorbing everything but yellow. But they are now darker and less light is coming to my eye. And so I still see it as, as orange, but the more paint I mix, the blacker it gets. The more light I mix, the whiter it gets, the more pigments you mix, the more black it gets. And you've, I'm sure, done this as finger painting as a kid, right? Finger paint with this, finger paint with this, finger paint with this, and pretty soon it's indigo. And you're like, ah, it's ugly. I started with red and yellow and green and blue and pretty, and now it's all... And that's because you took all of your finger paints and slid them all together, and it turns out black. Every finger painting picture my daughter has ever done winds up black because she can't stop adding color. So paints, the more you do, the blacker it gets. Light, the more you do, the whiter it gets. Um, so there are some color schemes that are additive and some color schemes that are subtractive. And you would spend a long time on this if this were art class. But for right now, we're moving on. This is the white, uh, this is the additive color family. So red and green give you yellow. Red and blue give you purple. Blue and green give you this light turquoisey color. And if you mix these three together, you get white light. And so the more you mix, the whiter it gets. This is what you get with wavelengths of light. But paint absorbs light. It doesn't create light. So you mix purple and yellow together to get red. And this is darker than either of these. And here, you mix this turquoisey color and purple together to get blue, and it's darker than either one of these. And turquoisey and yellow mixed together gives you green, darker than either of these. And if you mix these three together, you get black. 
So this is sometimes called the cyan, magenta, and yellow wheel, C-Y-M. And this is the red, green, blue wheel, the RGB wheel. Um, this is an additive color scheme. This is a subtractive color scheme. And that's it, folks. Any questions?